There's a great thing about being a classicist, which is it's a kind of get, get out of jail card for academic discussion, which is you can get involved in conversations in areas of all kinds of expertise where you actually know very little yourself. But you're not all that anxious about it, because if ever you get completely out of your depth, you just say, well, of course, as Aristotle once said, yeah. nah, that's fucked them. Okay, so it gives you that kind of uh, get out of jail card for any kind of academic discussion, because you can just divert things to ancient history or philosophy and basically escape. So occasionally, I, you know, I hang out with or read books on subjects where, frankly, you know, I don't really know what's going on. But what interests me sometimes about these books is if you look at the very extreme areas of people who are real experts in the use of data, you come up against some surprisingly unexpected counterintuitive insights into data, which actually sometimes bear out the kind of view that creative people and their instincts may often be right, and the people who arrive with a barrage of spreadsheets may be wrong. I'll give you one interesting example of this, which is that what worries me about data is absolutely not the fact that it can be useful, valuable, precious, creatively used, a source of great insight. It's the two things. One, it gives too much power to the people who have it to win arguments. Because we've created a business culture. You know how, to be honest, you know, most of middle class life in London is, you know, most of the effort if you're middle class in London isn't actually spent enjoying yourself. It's spent signalling the fact of how middle class you are. Because deep down, you'd actually be happier outside Greg's with a pie or something. But no, you've got to go on holiday in fucking Umbria and drink rosé wine all the time. You know. In business culture, it's slightly... <laughs> I mean, you know, most of middle class life... In, I mean, I'm an MV. I mean, you know, six corkscrews, no bottle opener. You know, you get the point. But actually, most of business culture is now around signalling how rational you are. And the best way of signalling that you're really rational is that you've got some numbers. Okay? And anybody with any numbers, however shit, will win an argument against anybody who's only got abstract nouns or words. Now that's actually pretty dangerous. Because what's happened is that numbers, and you, you see this in things like the shareholder value movement, for example. You know, a single metric, the only purpose, you know, a company is judged by its stock price and its last quarter's performance without any kind of dispassionate analysis of what's going on. But numbers in modern 21st century Britain and the United States, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, have become a bit like Norman French in 11th or 12th century Britain. You know, you can survive if you don't speak it, but you won't get very far. If you want to get into the church or you want to get into a position of power or influence, you've got to speak numbers. And that's dangerous because, first of all, Numbers often convey, therefore, a completely unwarranted strength to an argument. They may command complete and, and encourage completely unwarranted confidence in the people who actually analyse them. And they're very difficult to argue against. It's very hard to argue against a person who says 73.4 with words. This despite the fact that, for example, Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, the, you know, the primal kind of economics book, um, doesn't contain any maths at all. I don't think Marx contained. Is there any maths in Marx? Anybody in here? A um, bunch of planners. Come on, you should. A bunch of pinkos. You should know. Anyway, <laughs> but but it's very interesting, and it concerns me a bit because when you meet the people who really know this shit, um, I've met a couple of times Nassim Taleb, for example, the author of the Black Swan. People who really know this stuff to an extraordinary degree don't have the same confidence in sort of numerical or mathematical models. In fact, they're deeply sceptical. Nassim Taleb is a huge sceptic about, um, for example, big data. Um, there's a guy called Gerd Gigerenzer at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Berlin. Similarly, the guy who's coined the phrase ecological rationality. Um, and I'll give you an example very quickly of ecological rationality. Now, where this bias comes from is that at school, we did two lots of subjects. We did, like, sciencey subjects, which were maths or physics or chemistry. And they were sort of rational. They were a bit like the Olympic sports, which are judged by, you know, a, you know like the 100 metres, you, know. uh, you know. It's absolutely clear who's won. There's no subjectivity involved. Uh, there's a right answer. Okay? Then you did sort of artsy subjects, which were kind of vague and woolly. The point is, really good science 
actually accepts quite a lot of ambiguity. The science we do at school, the science that people do when they study economics at a business school doing an MBA, is all about neat mathematical models which convey the appearance of rationality because there's a right answer. If there is, and the definition of rationality is where there is provably a single answer to a problem which is demonstrably better than any other possible answer. And that's apparently a definition of what a rational answer is. In almost all of real life, no such situation pertains. So, for example, you can't, even though you can depict it mathematically, you can't play, well, you actually, you can't play chess mathematically. First of all, because if you look at chess computers, everybody's saying, but chess computers, they're very good. Chess computers use what humans use. They use pattern recognition. They don't calculate it probabilistically. If you tried to calculate chess probabilistically, it would actually involve, you know, the world's greatest supercomputer would take longer than the age of the universe to actually calculate the best move. The best chess players are basically fantastic. They've played 10,000 hours of chess, and they instinctively have evolved very, very good, uh, developed very, very good pattern recognition skills. It is not done probabilistically or rationally. People think it is. They think that chess is the high point of rationality. But what chess is about is partly knowing how to ignore huge amounts of information which are potentially on the board, far more than we can possibly... It's called intractable in mathematics. And when you get a certain level of complexity, the thing is, by definition, just intractable. It is impossible to solve. In any case, in order, in order to play chess rationally, you would also have to know the mental workings of the person you are playing against which would require several trillion neurons being wired up to a machine which actually detected their activity. Again, absolutely impossible. Most of the real world is not like the science we did at school. There is no single right answer. You, um, it's entirely erroneous to suggest there is one. And quite a lot of what we're doing with data and numbers is actually, effectively, therefore, a category error. Okay? It's trying to apply the science of Newtonian physics or of engineering where you can solve a problem mathematically and basically confidently say you're right. And it's taking that and applying it to an area of life, for example, meteorology, human behavior, or human psychology, which can neither be depicted numerically or mathematically nor can be solved that way. So, I mean, in, in philosophy, what a category error is, is basically... Um, the, the, the example that's always given of a category of universe, uh, error is someone arrive, an American tourist arriving at Oxford University and going, I want to see the university. And what Americans do apparently when they arrive in Oxford is they want to see a big building that says Oxford University on it. And it isn't that kind of entity. You know, the university is an assemblage of both colleges and of um, faculties or whatever they're called. But there isn't a building that's called Oxford University. And Americans go away slightly disappointed and upset by this. But the fact is, that's just a category error. And a lot of this stuff is in danger of exactly this. It's a trying to apply the kind of maths that's used to work out the surface area of a cone to something which can neither be depicted, where the important variables can't be depicted in any mathematical form, or are unknowable, or even if they were knowable, the answer would be absolutely mathematically incalculable. And Karl Popper talks about this, where he talks about the greatest mistakes being made by humanity comes from people trying to treat clouds as if they're clocks. His point is that in life there's a whole spectrum of stuff which goes from things like a working mechanism like clockwork all the way along to things that are like meteorology, for example, or hurricane formation. And he says trying to actually treat those same th two things using the same scientific tools, metrics and the same mathematical notation is just fundamentally wrong. So my argument is that sometimes this stuff is really valuable. The problem is, is we don't have, or it's very, very difficult to push back against. Unless you can call up Nassim Taleb on the phone and get him to talk to the procurement people, it's not very easy to fight. Here's just an example, by the way, if you can play the sound file of ecological rationality at work. I calculate 1549. It's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Cactus 1549, runway 4 is available if you want to make left traffic to runway 4. I'm not sure we make any runway. Um, what's over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. 
you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, LaGuardia departs guy, emergency inbound. Hey, guys. Cac is 1529 over the George Washington Bridge. Wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to our airport. Check. Does he need assistance? It stopped there. This is the miracle on the Hudson. What the guy goes on to say, must have get, got cut short, is uh, he goes, OK, we've cleared the runway at Teterboro. Do you want to land there? And Sullenberger, this is the miracle in the Hudson thing, simply replies, I can't make it. You're going to find us in the Hudson. And that's where the plane goes down. And that's where they landed. And indeed, everybody survived. What's interesting here is that in about 20 seconds from being offered a landing at Teterboro, 15 seconds, actually, Sullenberger replies, I can't make it. Now, he has lots of data. He has all the instruments in front of him. In order to know whether he could make it to Teterboro, the rational way you should solve that problem is by looking at your altitude, your velocity, the distance from Teterboro Airport, and your rate of descent. Um, bear in mind, both engines are out. Uh, and also your rate of deceleration. And then perform a whole series of quadratic and other equations in order to decide. You can't do that in 15 seconds. Okay? It's simply impossible. How does he do it in 15 seconds? Sullenberger, very, very brilliant and experienced pilot. Interestingly, um, most airlines in the world would have forced him to have retired about five years ago. Possibly because many employers actually undervalue instinctive experience in staff, which is an interesting question in general. That people who've just done stuff for a long time become instinctively very good at it. Um, he's a Texas Republican. I always think it's kind of amusing because secretly, however left-wing you are, right... When both engines in your plane go, I think you secretly hope your pilot's a Texas Republican. But we'll park that for the moment. OK? All right? <laughs> you know. And what happens is he doesn't use any of that data. He doesn't need to look at his instruments at all. Why? Because he's an amateur glider pilot. And what he actually does is he looks out of the window. And there's a very simple heuristic which doesn't use any data, it doesn't use any of the instrumentation in the cockpit, but all glider pilots know it instinctively. In fact, they may not even need to be taught it or be consciously aware of it, like many of our heuristics. And you look out of the window, and basically, pretty much, anything that on the ground that's going... You put your plane first into the, into the shallowest possible glide slope. You look out of the window, anything on the ground that's going up in your field of vision is a place where you can't land, and anything that's going uh, down uh, is a place where you can so he uses one piece of proxy data to stand in for eight bits of actual data and a whole heap of calculation. Given the data available, the use of a heuristic, and our system one brain is mostly uses heuristics in its software, is actually vastly to be preferred to the notionally rational answer. And that's true if you either have limited time, in the case of the pilot or the person catching the ball, or you simply don't have access to all the data you need. Now, in the case of marketing and understanding markets, the likelihood that we have access to the data that really matters is actually quite small, because many of the things that really matter don't actually appear in data. And there's a very strong problem in all modelling of data, which is, it's called, I think, variable admission bias. Anybody here know this? If you develop a model for the economy... And it says, basically, this correlates with this. It's as simple as this. And then you say, ah, but you forgot to include immigration into these statistics. So you then include immigration into the model. The model that regression analysis comes up with is a completely different model. So the second you add another variable to the things you actually calculate, the model that actually appears changes completely. The other problem is people talk about garbage in, garbage out, but you don't need much garbage in to get a lot of garbage out. I had a very interesting uh, um, experience of this, which was that, weirdly, Ogilvy gives me... It, it, it dates back to some absurd perk for the Ogilvy board dating back to about 1968, when you know, ag agencies actually looked after their staff, where, weirdly, Ogilvy pays for my petrol. I have no idea why they do this, but I don't question it, OK? <laughs> um, it also, by the way, had a, had a perverse economic incentive in that when I went to buy a car, I wanted to buy a really uneconomical car because second-hand cars are really cheap if they've got bad fuel consumption because everybody's terrified about fuel prices. So I basically went to the car dealer and said, give me a cheap gas guzzler. But anyway, the interesting <laughs> thing that happened is that I then had this funny, car, funny card, and the people who actually, it's called some weird fuel card. Has anybody else got one? He won't admit to it, because, of course, it'll cause a riot in the rest of your department. But 
Um, it keeps reporting on my fuel consumption because it calculates how much fuel I buy and every time I buy petrol I'm supposed to remember to tell the guy at the garage my mileage. And I was getting completely paranoid over a period of about three years because the fuel consumption of my car was getting worse every single month when I got the statement. I was thinking, what's wrong with the car? I need to take it in and get a service. You know, by, in another ten years' time, the thing will be doing sort of five gallons to the mile. And I was getting increasingly paranoid about this declining um, data variable in my car's fuel consumption. So about three years later, I remember that when I first got the card, I wasn't actually in the habit of using it. So on two occasions, I'd paid for my petrol by credit card instead because I'd forgotten to use this card. So that created this weird miracle period of about three months when I was getting about 100 miles to the gallon. And by the time I then started looking at my mileage figures, what they showed was continual and depressing decline because it said average for your car fuel, fuel consumption this month. And it was just getting worse every month. You only need one or two rogue things, and the whole thing's cocked up. But the problem is, is that all these things make these models extraordinarily dangerous, and yet this does nothing to actually diminish the confidence or influence of the people who wield them. And this is what I mean by the category error. It's the wrong kind of science. I genuinely believe that marketing can be a science. Uh, we know it isn't a science at the moment, because pretty much a definition of a science is something that makes progress. I think we can honestly say that the whole marketing and advertising world does lots of interesting work and develops case studies which are inarguably successful and interesting and useful, but it doesn't make very much actual discernible progress. But actually, if we stop thinking of science as the kind of stuff we did at, at school where we worked out and got a big tick next to it for working out the surface area of a cone and understood that there are a lot of sciences, among them anthropology, behavioural economics, um, sciences which don't have the same claim to exactitude, we'll actually be a hell of a lot better off. Because it will stop this slightly bifurcated divide in where you either try and pretend advertising is a science and insist that everything has to have numerical measures attached to it, or you go off in a huff and just go, it's art, you wouldn't understand. You know, there is actually a middle ground between those two positions. So data is great, especially behavioural data. One of the great advantages of data is it often is about what people actually do and when, not about the stupid answers they give to contrive, uh, you know, to contrive questions. But actually, behavioural data, if, if nothing else, it's good to have data about what people genuinely do, because it's sort of true. Um, it can also be used as the parking example, is fan a fantastic example of yield management. You can also use data to make experiences easier, actually more democratic. The thing that always interests me about yield management is that a really good yield management product like EasyJet with that pricing is actually a form of redistribution of wealth. It's never factored into that. Everybody talks about redistributing wealth through taxation. But actually, if you basically say, if you're a student or you're retired and you can fly on Wednesday in March, you can fly really cheaply, Whereas if you want to go on Friday in August, it's going to cost you a fortune. There's a form of redistribution of wealth there, of collaborative consumption, which is really, really interesting. Um, it can also make experiences more fun, also more meaningful. I have an interesting sort of debate occasionally with British Airways, which is the assumption about how a frequent flyer program works. It's all about standard economic incentives. You fly with us, we give you points. Part of it's psychological. I've argued with them for a while that you must occasionally show them that you recognise their lifetime miles. Because if you burn your miles and your tier points disappear every year, there's a slight feeling that BA is a bit like a goldfish. It forgets you every year. Part of the reason where pe people, frequent flyers, are loyal to a single airline is because if they know the airline knows how valuable they are and have been, they simply have a different, more trusting relationship to that airline. You basically know that if BA knows that you've spent 40,000 quid on various flights in them over the last 10 years, when it comes to getting the last flight out of Malmo on Friday night, they're not going to bump you, they're going to bump a student. Okay? Now that implicit game theoretic use of data, uh, the brain is actually f not a very good calculator, but it's a very good game theorist. A huge amount of how advertising works, according to some theories, is reputational game theory. The punter buying an advertised product asks himself the question, what has this bastard got to lose if he rips me off? If the bastard has an expensive reputation built up over many years through expensive advertising, he's reputationally fragile. If you've never heard of him before, and basically he's, you know, he has no sense of shame or embarrassment, the level of trust you can feel in buying from him is very different. That's an example of... Now, game theory uses a completely different form of maths. I think, who's the guy who tweets as John von Neumann? He's a planner. Is he here? 
Nobody knows. Um, but there's, a, there's a planner who tweets, says John, game theory uses a completely different sort of mathematical notation. It doesn't treat things as Newtonian physics. And so the mistake I think we may be making here is that quite a lot of human behavior is non-linear. It doesn't move in a straight line. If it's not, it's not only is it not linear, the curve doesn't even curve one way. The basic assumption of free market economics, which seeks to make a mathematical model out of individual human preference, is that if, if there's one truth of neoclassical economics, it's that the price-demand curve moves in one direction. It may not be a straight line, but it moves in one direction. Consistent experiments show this to be absolutely untrue. If you put an identical dress in a mail-order catalogue and send them out at random to different people, you will sell more at $29.95 and at $39.95 than you will at £34. Right? Then you have complexity. I went about three weeks ago to the Santa Fe Institute, which specialises in complexity in New Mexico. It's run by a guy called Murray Gelman, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics. And the point he made in a talk is that um, the... Mathematical notation we use for physics is wholly inadequate to describe our attempts to describe, for example, the real world. Sociological questions, behaviours, economies, climates, languages, or anything that's complex. His, his point was, he's, a, he's an actual, I think an astrophysicist, but anybody named Murray Gilman? Um, he's an astrophysicist, I think, and his point he made was, he said, what you have to realise is a single molecular worm is vastly more complex than the sun. So the sun is actually very, very simple mathematically to describe what's going on, if you're a Nobel Prize winning physicist. <laughs> but a small worm, which has feedback devices, correction devices, everything else going on, is much, much more complicated than the sun. And the idea that we can use the kind of physics we use to describe physical phenomena to describe psychological or mass phenomena is really dangerous. Here's probably the most simple cybernetic device you ever get, which is a centrifugal regulator. There must be some engineering nerds here. That's the thing. You know those steam engines where they have two balls? And to stop the steam engine going too fast, if the steam engine starts running faster, the centrifugal force pulls the balls outwards, OK? And either releases some excess steam, or I think cuts the input of steam into the, in, into the machine, and therefore slows it back down again. Okay? It's cybernetic because it incorporates feedback. Just to give you an idea, that's as simple as you can get cybernetically. The person who first did the mathematics involved in explaining how this thing worked was a guy called James Clark Maxwell, who was perhaps the great, one of the greatest geniuses of the 19th century, a guy who Einstein regarded as one of the two you know, fantastic founding, one of the giants on whose shoulders he was sitting. The maths, it took a total genius to work out the maths. The maths and the formula involved were so complex that actually it was impossible to actually compute them until advances in calculation about 30 to 40 years later. And that's a very, very simple device with a feedback. Mechanism. If you take human behaviour, where the behaviour of everybody affects the behaviour of everybody else, the idea that you can model that as if it's some simple sort of physical device is just erroneous. And sometimes we should just say this. This is just too, too complicated. As in Max Planck. Max Planck was the founder of quantum theory, again, uh, an extraordinarily bright man, and he had a friend who was an economist. And the friend said, Max, he said, um, there'd be a lot more money, frankly, he said, than in uh, economics than theoretical physics. And Max thought about it for a second or two, and he said, um, no, he said, I couldn't be an economist. Oh, why not? Said, the maths is too difficult. <laughs> now, this freaked the economist out, because, of course, the mathematics that underpins most um, conventional economic thought and economic models now, Max Planck could have done uh, in half an hour, standing on his head while juggling. It was absolutely no challenge to him at all. What Planck realised is that if you actually want to understand human economic behaviour, you have to understand that there are actually uh, forces in between the, ac the actors. The idea that you have an individual actor, unaffected by anybody else, going around maximising his own utility, may be convenient for mathematical neatness, but it's so inaccurate as to be extremely dangerous. Um, so, if you look at this sort of thing... <laughs> Now that, that last one, is one bit of sport, where basically, if you're running 100 metres, there's a whole load of science behind it, but basically it is, go as fast as you can, okay? You know, th there is a single metric that's used, there's a world record for it. Then you get this kind of thing. Always. 
strong in the team spirit, great over the last two years, particularly last year they came on tremendously. We've never seen a sprint like this. 10.2 twice earlier on in this competition. Saw him uh, take out Jason Kenny. Now what's interesting is I could go faster than that, okay? For the first two laps, this is all they do. In a few occasions, not in this particular race, they actually come to a standstill and have to play that game you did as a kid of not falling over while you're stationary. Have we got time to watch it to the end? We have just, do we? Well, okay. What's most amusing is the people who are in the middle of this while they're going at three miles an hour shout, Come on, Chris! <laughs> <laughs> So if there is a jump, they have the benefits of that banking to roll down. Can't do that around the bend because it's so steep. Tune to ride at uh, over 50 kilometres an hour to be squirted to it. The reason for this is that if you go fast, the person ahead creates basically a, a, what's called drafting opportunity for the person behind. And the person behind can follow in his wake and he enjoys such an advantage in terms of air resistance that going fast with someone behind you becomes incredibly tiring and you're almost doomed to lose. So the, the, the strategy of this particular sport is that uh, you have to spend as little time as possible going fast in first position. Okay? Uh, this is seriously, this is by the way the, the, the world championship. This is the finals of the world championship here. Yeah. I'm not making this up. <laughs> I think that's the best sport at the Olympics. Now, what's going on here is that you have a sport unlike the 100 metres, where what the other people do matters. In the 100 metres, you try and go as fast as you possibly can. There you have completely different conditions. Now, if you think about it, most competitive businesses are in two, the, the cycling event, rather than one. Which is actually the chief determinant of their business success is their degree of differentiation from their competitors or which particular niches they occupy and which they don't. Are you in... Now, as many people say, sailing is actually a better example, a far better sporting metaphor for most business, with things like clear air, clean air, and then the kind of divergent strategies of tacking off to a different part of the lake, is a much better metaphor for a competitive business in a competitive market than something like athletics. This is just a very small two minutes. I'm only going to show you two minutes of this, but you can find it on YouTube. Um, it's, has anybody seen this, the, uh, the commentary on the, uh, on the sailing? You've you got it, exactly. Yes for the 30th Olympiad, and uh, we're at the ceiling. Yeah, there you can hear the, uh, the Olympic horn being sounded. Signifies there's only four minutes left in this race, and it's looking very close and confusing. This is actually the same <laughs> <time. laughs> as well. Martinez de la Vos from Espanol. And she's at 26 points, whatever that means. Mind your head. <laughs> <laughs> Very confusing scenes here. We don't know who's going to Is that Russian? Far left. They're, the, they're ahead of everyone else. That's the wrong way to Some madman there going the wrong way. Very far. Go back. You know, you're not going to win any medals. Okay. 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 Length 4.23. We have a beat of 1.37. It's controversial. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. 
I wish all sports commentary were like that. Frankly, that guy could have the job as the uh, second audio channel on all sporting events for me. This is... I don't know, it is a spoof, yeah. yeah no, it's a, but it's utterly brilliant. Uh, this, is, this is Taleb's point in his new upcoming book, Anti-Fragility, um, that there is the stuff that sort of Newtonian physics and science can describe, and there's real life. And actually, what we're trying to do is apply the certainties of a very, very small area of science to things that are just much more complicated. There is much more going on there uh, than there is in the model for building a bridge. And we do occasionally need to push back about this because, of course, the people who appear with a, with a bit of data in any meeting effectively have the status of effing Einstein, regardless of the value of what they actually carry because of this bias. Here's Hayek uh, accepting the 1972 uh, Nobel Prize ex um, for economics. He says, it seems to me that the failure of the economists to guide policy more successfully is closely connected with their propensity to imitate as closely as possible the procedures of the brilliantly successful physical sciences, an attempt which in our field may lead to outright error. It is an approach which has come to be described as the scientistic approach, an attitude which, as I defined it some 30 years ago, is decidedly unscientific in the true sense of the word, since it involves a mechanical and uncritical application of habits of thought to fields different from those in which they've been formed. Okay? A bit more hack. The crucial issue, unlike the position that exists in the physical sciences, in economics and other disciplines which deal with essentially complex phenomena, the aspects of the events to be accounted for, about which we can get quantitative data, are necessarily limited and may not include the important ones. Yeah. Human mood. You all know my example about the Eurostar. That's the point, that when you work with the Eurostar and spend six billion making the journey from Paris to London faster, okay, there are certain numerical measures like speed, duration, and rolling stock utilization, which are very, very pertinent because you can make mathematical models out of them. How comfy the trains are, whether the food's any good, um, or indeed whether you get Wi-Fi on the train, so whether your journey is useful or useless, doesn't appear in any mathematical model, so it's effectively ignored. But what's really important, as Einstein said, what, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. I went on the Eurostar to Paris yesterday for a business meeting. All I can say is that if there's one thing putting me off taking the Eurostar, it isn't how long the journey is, it's the fact that the Gare du Nord is a total shithole. Um, while in the physical sciences, the investigator will be able to measure what on the basis of a prima facie theory he thinks important, in the social sciences, often that that is treated as important, uh, which happens to be accessible to measurement. Got that? So in physics, Temperature, pressure, volume, all those things you can express numerically and work out the mathematical relationship between them. You can't work out the relationship between um, people's willingness to pre pay, pay a pro premium to go on Eurostar and basically um, number of crackheads outside the Gare du Nord, okay? which may be the, the chief and principal thing in influencing you not to take that train again. Okay? Uh, this is sometimes carried to the point where it is demanded that our theories must be formulated in such terms that they refer only to measurable magnitudes. That's basically, if it isn't maths, it isn't science. The Austrians, of whom Hayek is one, the Austrians are distinguished partly because they tend to be right-wing libertarian nutters, or at least the followers are. But what is also interesting about them is that they refuse to use maths because they claim that human preference is not mathematically expressible. So in economics, they actually, and of course they're excluded in most economics faculties precisely for that reason, because they insist on going to their students and talking to them about stuff, uh, rather than formulating abstruse mathematical models. Uh, earlier people than that, Samuel Johnson, who could be attacking the shareholder value movement, although obviously it hadn't been invented then, there's a kind of mercantile speculation which ascribes every action to interest, and considers interest as only another name for pecuniary advantage, but the boundless variety of human affections is not to be thus easily circumscribed. Everything sounds good in 18th century English, but that's particularly good. Anybody read Fanny Hill? If you're going to read porn, read 18th century porn, okay? You know, breasts of no inconsiderable rotundity. That's the sort of stuff you should be reading. <laughs> and here's the Earl of Shaftesbury. Passion, humour, caprice, zeal, faction, and a thousand... Faction, by the way, is um, uh, uh, the, I think in that case, the 17th century equivalent of effectively, net, you know, social media, network effects. Faction and a thousand other springs which are counted to self-interest have as considerable part in the movements of this machine. There's, there are many more wheels and counterpoises in this engine than are easily imagined. And those of two people, effectively 300 years ago, opposing the idea that you can kind of mathematically model um, human behaviour and reduce it to a few variables. Anthony Tazgill, one of, you, one of you planner chappies, brilliantly coined this phrase, the arithmocracy. 
for the people who basically rule through access to numbers. I'm very grateful for him doing that because I previously called it the autistocracy and then got into trouble for being politically incorrect. Um, so aristocracy is a fantastically useful concept. And there's also a rationalist double standard, which we have to watch out for. Broadly speaking, as a creative person, I describe it as this. If you have a creative idea, before you can present it to anyone or put it into effect, you have to present it to some more rational people for a cost-benefit analysis, a feasibility study, and all that other kind of stuff. And by the way, that's probably right. You don't want creative people to take over an organisation without some sort of rational check or balance. What's dubious, though, is this does not apply the other way around. If you come up with a rational idea and you have some numbers to defend it, you never think to say, well, before I present this to the board, I'll show it to some wacky people to see if they can come up with a different idea. And so there's a one-way street where creativity is policed by rationality, but no one in the rationality camp thinks to apply the process the other way around. You can get fired for being irrational. You don't, by and large, get fired for being unimaginative. If there's one reason to work in an advertising agency, it's this. It is the only single business culture in the world, practically, where you can get promoted for making an irrational suggestion. Everything else, everybody... I've, I've worked occasionally in the public sector, and the problem with the public sector is that they're basically terrified of appearing silly. So the entire conversation is all around appearing to be rational and sensible. So it's almost impossible to get anywhere new or interesting. So here's some concepts. Anti-fragility is a book coming out by Taleb, which has some very interesting ideas in this. A case where a debate you can look at online where people are claiming a category error took place and people were applying conventional physics to a complex system is the diet debate. Has anybody noticed I'm a bit thinner? Nobody? No. <laughs> you did. Well done. Thank you. Uh, the reason is I've adopted a heuristic diet. You basically don't eat carbohydrates. You don't eat particularly not sugar. Um, and weirdly, uh, the, uh, the, the low-carb diet is particularly opposed to fructose. Um, so uh, you don't eat fruit if you can help it. So the Scots are right about something anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, very, very interesting, because first of all, because, although it's ir apparently irrational, okay, um, first of all, it's very easy to follow, because instructions that say you can do this, but you can't do that, are much easier to follow psychologically than instructions that say you can do so much of this, but then stop. If you think about it, calorie restriction diets, which restrict how much you eat more than what you eat, require the constant exercise of vigilance and self-control. If you look at Jewish dietary law, it's sensibly binary. Because instructions that are... All you've got to do, frankly, is exercise self-control when you shop. And then you won't eat any carbs anyway because there aren't any in the house. OK? So in psychological terms, the heuristic diet works very well, even though it's apparently silly. Um, a guy called Gary Taubes also supports it. He's a very, very good physicist who is at Stanford. And for weird reasons, he got interested in the whole dietary debate. And he said, everybody in diet is assuming that the human body obeys Newton's second law of thermodynamics, which is basically energy in minus energy out equals fat. Okay? And nearly all those take a lot of exercise, um, you know, uh, eat, eat, eat less food. Nearly all of those instructions are based on that assumption. He said, hold on a second. The human body is patently an extremely complex system which may not treat all um, energy sources in the same way. And the argument is that if you eat sugar and carbohydrates, it produces insulin, which effectively encourages the body to retain fat. Okay? Now, the point there is this is a wonderful case. You go on the web and look for people like Dr. John Briffer, because there's a whole school of dissenting <coughs> thought which says, do you really think it's that simple? And that's a very interesting point. Uh, Gerd Gigerens, I've mentioned, um, the Austrian school, won't use numbers. John Kay's book, Obliquity, which is the best way to... Uh, to, to achieve an end, maybe not to pursue it directly. There's a danger that data makes you very, very non-oblique. It also may actually lend itself to things like uh, wind tunnel effect, where if lots of competing companies all use the same metrics, they end up producing very similar products. There's a very great danger that models actually lead to... Um, models lead to monotonous markets, effectively. Goodhart's Law, anyone know this one? Fantastic, fantastic uh, thing from a Treasury uh, economist. Goodhart's Law, broadly speaking, says any metric that becomes a target loses its value as a metric. Because once people are actually pursuing it, it's automatically distorted. So the classic case is when you ring your doctor and ask for an appointment, right? They always say you have to ring back tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. As I jokingly said once, 
In, well, my grandfather was a doctor. Most doctors did house calls and actually went to your house on the grounds that you're ill. But with the exception of Howard, Harold Shipman, nobody seemed to do that um, uh, recently. But nonetheless, they also ring back at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Why are they doing that? It's because they have a target which says that patients must be seen within one day. So if they make you ring at 8 o'clock in the morning and they won't let you book an appointment one or two days in advance, they automatically meet the target. That's a perfect case of Goodhart's law, where the metric has been fantastically improved by making it a target, but the result is a kind of bullshit. Uh, in NHS hospitals, they actually leave people waiting in the ambulance outside. Do you know this? There's a line of ambulances outside NHS hospitals, um, precisely because you're only admitted to hospital when you leave the ambulance. So if they leave you in the ambulance until they're free to treat you, they look really, really good. Okay? The other thing they did, by the way, is they, to save money on trolleys, they bought really expensive trolleys and redefined them as beds. And there was some weird crap going on there. No, that's right. They, redefined a, they bought a really expensive trolley, defined it as a bed, and therefore the time patients spent on trolleys was miraculously reduced. That was the reason. Okay? That's Goodhart's law. Crabtree's bludgeon... Uh, it's a response to Occam's razor. Occam's razor is, you know, the simple thing, that the simplest explanation is, by and large, best. Um, Crampton's bludgeon basically says, there is no set of data, however contradictory or absurd, from which the human brain cannot conjure up a plausible narrative. So there's a huge danger that we tend to believe data because our brains automatically construct a plausible story around it, even if that data's rubbish. Uh, variable admission bias, that's the thing I mentioned earlier, that what variables you include in your model have an insane effect on the model. So since in marketing there are huge numbers of variables, not least things like mood, you know, which can't be accounted for, um, uh, then there's a huge danger that our models may be really quite disturbing. Uh, take the best, this is a Gigerenzer approach, which is actually take the single variable that correlates best with what you want and just follow that one. So he's done tests with mail order advertisers, which is the single best indicator of someone's likelihood to buy uh, was how recently they bought before. Not very surprising. So they started just mailing people who'd bought recently before and upweighting the mailings to them. A competing set of customers were put in a different group where they created this extraordinarily complex um, regression model around about 10 uh, customer behaviours. And the more complex thing was less reliable as a predictor than the simple one. Why, why is that going, what's going on here? Uh, the reason, the counterintuitive reason is, as you use more variables, the signal-to-noise ratio gets much worse. You just get rubbish correlations for no particularly good reason. And uh, there's another reason, too, which I can't remember. Um, overfit is another thing, where, the, where you, you basically, um, you use too many variables in a model to make it fit one set of data to a point where the, where the model becomes silly for something else. This is the important thing to remember, is that a procurement office is basically a failed accountant, an accountant's a failed economist, an economist is a failed engineer, and an engineer is a failed mathematician. That is tough. I'm being a bit mean. Um, I left that slide out when I was presenting to Ernst and Young yesterday, by the way. Um, <laughs> but what's a bit dubious is people who, frankly, aren't very good at maths, okay? You know, I wouldn't mind if the procurement office was run by Nassim Taleb or Gerd Gigerenzer or, you know, or Max Planck. You know, you'd be listening to these guys. But anybody, however dumb, with access to some numerical measures, now enjoys within an organisation a degree of power which is probably excessive. And why this matters, too much time chasing diminishing returns. Very little in business is linear. And if you pursue any metric for too long, it starts becoming useless. Perfect case in this, call, telephone call centres. They had lots of data about how long it took people to answer. And they got obsessed and obsessed and obsessed with bonusing people for answering the phones earlier. They then discovered that actually, provided you answered within eight seconds, whether you answered within eight seconds or three didn't matter a shit to customer perception. This was just pursuing a metric because it was numerically available. And patently, 15 to eight makes a big difference to how pissed off your customers are. Eight to three, you might as well spend your time on something else. So that's the case of just too much time chasing diminishing returns, which I think the shareholder value movement has been guilty of. It's driven efficiency in business to a point where actually it starts becoming stupid. Um, underinvestment in innovation, which is that actually the game theoretic thing, Schumpeter and the Austrians say capitalism works effectively because it's an endless process of discovery in a state of disequilibrium, where companies experiment and ultimately find out what consumers want and are willing to pay for through a process of Schumpeterian creative destruction. Okay? Now, that's actually a much better vision of the jungle that is real business than the idea of perfect equilibrium that neoclassical economics people hold. 
And if, you, if more people in business were Schumpeterian, you know, W.H. Smiths would own Amazon, basically. Okay? But they're not. What W.H. Smith spent their time doing was instead of looking for creative disruption and disruptive ideas, um, underinvestment in innovation, including, by the way, what the Austrians acknowledge as innovation, they acknowledge that marketing is a form of innovation. Because if you can get the market to look at a thing in a new way, you've created value just as much as if you create a new thing. Okay? If you create a new appreciation of an existing thing, that is as much value creation to an Austrian as actually creating a thing that solves a pre-existing problem. Wind tunnel marketing, I mentioned. And finally, a book recommendation. Common Sense, Uncommon Nonsense, I think it's called, is that right? By Jules Goddard, Goddard at the LSE, who is himself an Austrian, is a very interesting debunking of many of the pseudo-mathematical assumptions that actually underlie business and economics. And a final great book, Steve Keen's book, Debunking Economics is a great, great read. But the vital thing to remember is I have no problem with all this stuff. I have a huge problem with the amount of power and influence it gives to the people who control it. Thanks very much.